So we will be starting our webinar. So Mr. Tapan Mojimdar, are you there, sir? Yes. Yes, I am here. Yes. yes. Thank you. So let us start today's webinar. Now, today we are starting this webinar or as a Gem and Jewelry Export Promotion Council, we are doing this webinar on India-Australia ECTA. So nobody is better here today than Mr. Tapan Mojundar to talk about that. Because Mr. Tapan Mojundar is an additional DGFT, but I know him from his days when he used to handle the Gem and Jewelry files uh, in his capacity in the DGFT and chapter 4 was his strongest domain at that point of time uh, in the foreign trade policy and after that he, uh, he was in different capacities but one of his important capacities was the negotiator on behalf of the government and that he continued at Geneva also in WTO and then he has come back and he has taken this mantle very successfully and we are thankful to him that uh, the government has completed and signed this India-Australia ECTA on 2nd of April 2022. And he is here today amongst us. He is a very accomplished officer and one of the most trusted officers of the government in terms of carrying on with the mandate of the government. You know, always we find that uh, there are some officers who have the capability of breaking through deadlocks and doing uh, or taking the you know, mandate of the government forward. And he is one of those officers. And I believe because of that, he enjoys a lot of confidence uh, of different ministers because I know that he was always under so many uh, ministers he has worked under so many commerce secretaries he has worked but if the confidence of the department upon him has not waned because of different personality who has come so thank you uh, sir for joining us today and uh, it will be a very i think enlightening session for all our members because india australia ecta has been discussed in different forums but in our forum, the way he will discuss, which will be basically underlining how the gem and jewelry exporters from our sectors can utilize this to expand their exports. And believe me, nobody else could have discussed further because the officers in government, they have the knowledge maybe of the agreement because there's hundreds of products which are there in the ECTA. But Tapan Babu has this knowledge of also the Jameson jewelry from which he can talk about this. And in fact, I am privy to the fact that uh, the government is also negotiating the India, Canada FTA, the India EU FTA, uh, the, the GCC also will start sometime soon, I believe. Uh, so all these FTAs are on the radar of the government and Tapun Babu is, uh, you know, is a very important part of the negotiations. In fact, uh, what I understand today also the Canadian with that Canadian team discussions have happened and uh, Tapan Babu is part and parcel of those discussions. So all good luck to the team for giving us more FTAs of this uh, sort, like what we have done in India, UAE SIPA and India, Australia ACTA. More are to come and we have all good wishes for the team in some cases where uh, Tapan Babu is leading that. So over to you, uh, Mr. Tapan Majundar. But before that, I would also like to say that our division today also with us, the Gem and Division of the Ministry of Commerce. And from the Gem and Division of Ministry of Commerce, uh, Mrs. Nidhi, Nidhi Pandey is there with us. So whatever the government deals and Gem and desk, that means the knowledge desk of the government is the Gem and desk. So Mrs. Pandey is part of that desk and is a very important uh, personality in that desk because no file moves without uh, going through her. And in fact, the initial notes and initial research has to be done by her only. So this is a team and thank you, madam, for joining us today also. And now I'll uh, leave it to Mr. Tapan Majumdar to take us through the session today of hey. Australia ECTA. Thank you, sir. 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 Th
I think we'll request Mrs. Pandey also to say a few words before Mr. Tapan starts the presentation. Okay. So With your permission, yeah. Tapanji? Yes. So that will be better. Ah. So, Mrs. Pandey, I uh, request you to, you know, also say a few words. So before, uh, you know, our star of the day, Mr. Tapan Munjinda takes over. Thank you, sir. Uh, as you are aware that uh, Australia is one of the biggest trading partners in the Oceania region. And uh, over the years, trade between India and Australia has increased significantly. And in, uh, in the year 21-22, it has reached to 25.40 billion US dollars. And uh, with increase in trade between the two countries, the trade deficit that it has also increased, it has... Uh, uh, doubled. It has also been doubled. As um, Jams and uh, it is uh, known that uh, uh, India's export basket, it is it consists of 31 uh, product categories of which Jams and Jewelry is the fourth largest contributor after petroleum products, uh, engineering goods and drugs and pharmaceuticals. During the year 22-23, uh, government has assigned given the target of approximately 400 million US dollars for gems and jewelry sector, of which we have already achieved the, uh, achieved the uh, 260 million during the period April to November 22, which is approximately 65% of the target. And uh, there is a huge potential of trade between India and Australia. And recognizing this potential, uh, this uh, the two countries has signed this ECTA uh, in April 22, and which has uh, uh, become operational. It has become operational in December 22, and we believe that uh, this uh, signing of this uh, agreement will it will further in our relationship uh, uh, between the two countries, and it will uh, uh, enhance bilateral trade of goods and services between the two countries. Apart from this, it will also create new opportunities, employment opportunities, raise living standards of the kind of people and improve the general welfare of the people of the two countries. Uh, as you are aware that uh, Australia is mainly a raw material producing country. Intermediate products are produced there. So uh, with the signing of this agreement, there is a huge opportunity, wide array of opportunities for Indian manufacturers to uh, export finished goods to Australia. So uh, definitely it is a very uh, good thing and it will be a win-win situation for both the countries. And uh, uh, over the period of time, it will also turn the negative balance of trade in favor of India. With these words, I uh, conclude. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, and now we request the keynote speaker, Mr. Tapar Majumdar. To start, start his, uh, his uh, the speech. And should we have the presentation now or you would like to do it later, sir? Uh, we can start from now itself. Okay, we'll just share it. Uh, I, I, I can share from here. I can also share from here. No, no, I will. It'll be easier. Okay. You can share it, please. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first of all, uh, I thank you, the James and Jewelry EPC, particularly Mr. Ray, uh, Mr. Duggal, and others who have organized this meeting. In fact, we were looking into uh, this type of interactions from uh, quite some time, but uh, unfortunately, it was happening in a, a different way. We were interacting with all the EPCs taken together, not exclusively for the James and Jewelry, but other sectors. Now, I also thank the various exporters and uh, the leaders of the James and Jewelry exporting community. And at the same time, I also thank uh, Ms. Nidhi Pandey, who has joined us uh, today for the discussions. Uh, my, uh, first of all, I would like to tell you, everyone, that, you know, uh, this is, I will have a very short presentation. I will try to summarize the presentations so that that you know, I, ha I have maximum time for discussions with the exporting community. Like, you know, at times we are unable to understand what is the actual difficulty in terms of, uh, like, you know, how we can promote our exports, how we can help the exporters in terms of uh, various provisions, which already we have, but how to further simplify them. So but that will be my approach. Uh, perhaps, you know, uh, 
um this will be the first discussion and we will have a continuous discussion over the time since your time is very valuable in terms of your businesses and all i will not take much more time but i will run through some of the slides which i thought that perhaps i need to um, uh, tell you uh, first of all you know um, just give me a minute one minute just yeah yeah the uh, first of all uh, all of you know like miss um, uh, nidhi pandey has just now mentioned that you know both the countries have a quite quite a, uh, quite, uh, quite thing which you know a lot of things which are very common and uh, at the same time uh, both the countries in terms of the trade are primarily complement like you know miss nidhi pandey mentioned about that we are generally procuring the uh, the raw materials the integrated products from australia and we are exporting finished product but our export you know volume is not so high it's a limited volume which we want to uh, increase through this ftas and better understanding with the other side now having said so you know all of us that uh, australia is also a part of the quad india australia japan and usa at the same time we also have a supply chain resilience initiative india australia and japan they are the partners in this collateral uh, you know supply chain resilient initiative which was uh, only instituted in to, um, april 2021 and uh, we are working on that how to improve the relations apart from that there are 7 lakh indian diaspora who are you know uh, they are present in australia which uh, which is well known to all of you and uh, indian diaspora is the second highest tax paying diaspora and now they are going to cross the even the chinese and uh, perhaps it will be the first one in terms of uh, indian diaspora similarly uh, uh, all of you know that on second will we signed the agreement and uh, then on 29th december it came into operation now if you look at the you know trade balance which just miss uh, pandey mentioned about Uh, but i will not i am not getting in the facts and figures which is available in the website also but if you look into the india's imports primarily 96% of the raw materials and intermediate products and highly concentrated mainly in coal and all of you know that you know there has been change in the budget uh, the duty on the coals uh, coal this time also this will be helpful to those who are you know in the engineering sector other sectors or even the electricity generation the thermal uh, power generation so this will this is expected to uh, help them in terms of getting cheaper raw material then uh, india primarily exports fresh products and uh, um, at the same time india is also spending about dollars 4 billion uh, in education of students in australia which is a quite big and therefore we are going to have some sort of cooperation agreement wherein we will have uh, you know systems in place wherein education degrees and other things you know worked upon with them now if you look at the figure which i have told uh, you can see from here that on the left side india's imports from australia how uh, what is the composition of that and uh, as i mentioned 96% is about all the raw materials and intermediate products whereas india exports to australia these are mostly consumer goods as well as the capital goods and the intermediate products raw materials is minuscule about 1% this is the just the export figure i don't want to get into it but uh, when you look into the gains in terms of india and australia now what is the gains to india it is known all known to all of you that they have levelized on 100% of their tariff lines of course their 40, 48% of their tariff lines were with the zero duty already but uh, 52% now have they have uh, under the agreement they have allowed zero duty access some of the lines they said that over a period of 5 years but it is not pertaining to the james and jewelry sector these are pertaining to primarily engineering sector that is steel and some aluminum uh, products but if you look into the you know product categories where uh, we will be it will be helpful for india to exports is primarily labor intensive sectors and which were in there are duty of about 4 to 5% uh, james and jewelry doesn't have duty except for certain you know Uh, varieties of jewelries wherein they have they had duty which they would uh, reduce to zero uh, so therefore these these are the primarily you know gains but on the other hand if you look into uh, what we have given to australia is not as, um, significantly what they were looking into they have asked us for a large number of products wherein agricultural products were predominant and then certain you know 
mining and other products wherein we have kept restrictions and we didn't allow them completely so therefore this this agreement particularly this agreement is an agreement wherein you are getting uh, some advantage additional advantages here what is happening on the one hand you have not given uh, what they were looking into but at the same time you have got what you were looking into in terms of the value in terms of the uh, tariff lines and in terms of the total value because they have given you 100% market access of course we have to see that if there are any non tariff barriers which can be you know sorted out over the time now in terms of um, uh, uh, some of the agriculture products of course it is a gems and jewelry you know discussions perhaps uh, it is for your just information nothing to do with the you now when you look into the gems and jewelry um, uh, then definitely india's uh, like you know australia's imports in gems and jewelry comes to around 0.3 billion of course it is into uh, 2021 and from the world it is about 6.6 uh, billion so you can think of you know we are in the range of 4.5 to 5% of the australia's import share on the gems and jewelry and there is a scope and uh, the australia is a large importer of gold diamonds and other jewelries of course diamonds there are a major importer of the diamonds um, and therefore there is a lot of scope we see that under the uh, like you know um, in terms of the gems and jewelry sector there is a potential and uh, india is definitely facing complaint from a number of countries which i will deal up, uh, when i go to the sub subsequent slides more you know in terms of other all the products taken together if you look into the india's global exports and then india's exports to australia which i just mentioned and which ranges from different years you know it is the average of 18 to 20 therefore figure has been shown as 3.6% of the total year otherwise it is around 4 to 5% which is for the gems and jewelry and other sectors are also shown here this is in uh, in, uh, in in the uh, again uh, this is for 2019 20 and 21 uh, you can see that the changes india's share in the australia's imports 7.9% to 3.5% and going to 5.9% then when i compare with other countries in 2021 we see that if chapter 71 is taken together all taken together Uh, the you know um, i was surprised to see that papua new guinea is having a maximum share that is 21 21% of the exports to australia whereas usa 13% and india at 5.9 for to as i mentioned 4 to 5 to 5.9% uh, india share varying from uh, time to time now when you look into the uh, the the performance in uh, april to december that you know performance for the india's exports Uh, to various oceania region countries australia you can see that at the top of course we have a high target of uh, not high target in comparison to the market we have in australia but a target fixed for 20 when uh, 22 23 was 417 uh, you know million dollars export achieved is 276 therefore we have achieved 66.2% still we have to achieve about 34% of the uh, and similarly you have other you know um, islands you can see the uh, new zealand also new zealand also the target is not so high it is 32.1 million dollars which is quite you know uh, and uh, we are uh, exports are about 17.6% here also we are lagging a bit uh, like you know we have achieved only 54.9% till december now we are left with 3 months and uh, let us see how we perform in the coming year then uh, coming to the individual products in december i was looking into december because what happened you know the agreement entered the force in the uh, on 29th of december so i was uh, looking at the figures that if there could have been some you know chances but since it was on force only on 29th of december hardly you had 2 3 days time naturally exports might not have grown and at the same time there were holidays in most of the developed countries perhaps uh, this was not the right time for Uh, increase in exports in the gems and jewelry sector so various sectors it's evident from here that you know diamonds and the uh, precious uh, stones exports uh, constitute a significant part of the uh, these exports and at the same time uh, some of the you know articles of jewelry made out of the silver and the uh, gold is uh, predominant here here it is the same figure uh, reflected there in which i am just just want to pass through when i when we look into the some of the prominent sectors where india is doing well like for example diamond non industrial you can see the first one here 
uh, the share when you look into the exports which has um, happened in uh, 2021 now india has the maximum share but when you look into the precious stones again brazil has the maximum share and similarly the other other categories this country categories only for those sectors where india is doing well in australia now i come to the after the figures i come to the rules of origin which uh, i continue to you know uh, work here and for the rules of origin under various fta's as well as in the, uh, indus ekta now if you look at the rules of origin all of you are aware that you know rules of origin generally two rules are applicable one primarily two rules one is wholly opt in another is uh, the general rule which is generally csh plus 35% 20% depending on the item here in case of the uh, psr you know product specific rules if you look into because for any product to get the preferential access they need to qualify for this uh, rules of origin and rules of origins are specified for the products india was not in uh, india did not have this practice of specifying you know uh, rules of origin for individual tariff lines that is at six digit level and you can think of what herculean job it is when you look at uh, 6400 tariff lines at six uh, at a six level which is a significantly high number of tariff lines and uh, not for james and jewelry but taken together all products the, in india has entered it uh, in such negotiations recently because of the you know um, uh, we have negotiations with uh, uk with european union and canada wherein they are insisting for individual line wise uh, this uh, product specific rules which will be the certificate for the purpose of certificate of origin in case of india australia we had about 807 lines wherein uh, there is a product specific rules and these product specific rules if you look into most of them has been uh, specified as ctsh plus 1.5% value addition and and at 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 different places we have uh, this is this is pertaining to chapter 71 i am talking about chapter 71 uh this is wherein where we have indicated but these does not cover all the tariff lines of the james and jewelry it covers certain tariff lines of james and jewelry as i mentioned that only 807 lines have been agreed under the india australia india australia negotiation as you know this is this is uh, economic uh, cooperation and uh, and trading agreement ekta and uh, this was the first phase of negotiations the second phase of negotiations will start very shortly scoping paper is uh, getting ready and after that one of the conditions in the you know mentioned in the agreement is that there will be discussions for the discussions on the rules of origin under india australia, uh, india australia wherein uh, product specific rules will be established for all the products uh, now here in uh, when you look into india eu generally the condition is for james and jewelry seven, chapter 71 ctsh plus 3.5% value addition now you will definitely ask me a question why it is ctsh plus 1.5% in australia but in india ue it is a ctsh plus 3.5% in this context um, uh, you know uh, we had a discussions with the james and jewelry epc as well as exporters we are working on that that in the next phase of negotiations how we can accommodate you know uh, that value addition and how we can look into this india morrisus you have a plain primarily cth cth change in tariff tariff it means at means changes at four digit level and for some lines we have cth and 30% value addition whereas india korea sepa we have plain cth and you know uh, some of you are aware of that some of the incidences which uh, happened a few years back and uh, india has to resort to you know action and uh, then uh, because it was found that there is a misutilization of the condition of cth and the imports are uh, taking place uh, taking the uh, benefit of the simple you know rules of origin on the one hand we have to see that rules of origin are not very complex it is simplified so that exports our offensive interests are taken well care of at the same time imports of raw materials are not hindered but on the other hand we have to also see that it should not be uh, you know third country exports circumvention of the provisions then in india ctsh plus 35% valuation one more thing i would like to tell you that there is a provision under india korea india japan india asean that uh, the countries will uh, look into the review of the agreement now for india korea sepa first review has already happened and we have suggested changes in the you know value addition for the james and jewelry sector along with other sectors and uh, the negotiations are going on 
perhaps you know maybe after 6 or 8 months when the final negotiation uh, concludes then at that point of time we will have a value addition which will be helpful to all the but in case of india asean we are still negotiating we are talking with them in terms of having a review of the you know the uh, the entire uh, agreement in terms of uh, like you know the provisions wherein we need some comfort level at the same time we have to also uh, give them some comfort level. now coming to the rules of origin in india australia ifta which i was just mentioning primarily you see that uh, these are not for all the lines these are for limited lines like articles of jewelry and parts thereof articles of gold smith all these have been put with the ctsh at means changes at the six digit level and at and 1.5% value addition if you go through all uh, all these provisions it is just ctsh plus 1.5% because as i mentioned that uh, the india australia ekta it was one of the you know uh, landmark in terms of uh, uh, like you know the number of days within which this agreement was signed similar to that of the india ue uh, fta this was also signed within a very short period of time on 30th of september this was you know into like you know ministers agreed to have a uh, agreement uh, fast track it and then from the month of december itself the negotiation started partly and from january you can think of about 90 days time all the agreements were uh, brought in so having said so naturally you know uh, the time period for negotiating on individual tariff lines and stakeholder consultation was limited but even then uh, it was tried to see that you know our offensive interests are taken care of now coming to the uh, this india canada fta which is under negotiations you see there are as you know that um, the all the developed countries they are part of the mostly most of them are part of the global value chain and they want very simplified systems not you know uh, the our traditional systems we have been following whether it is a james and jewelry whether it is a um, uh, apparels whether it is a engineering products electronics anything they are of the view that you know such a stringent conditions uh, does not allow the global value chain to operate because nowadays most of the countries operate uh, taking into uh, account the global value chain for most of the products so having said so we are you know uh, working on and uh, here some of the suggestions we have from our side that for the pearls natural or cultured it should be wholly obtained wholly wholly obtained means produced in that country raised and produced in produced and raised in that country and then uh, you know then it will be considered as a wholly obtained for diamonds we have wholly obtained plus ctsh plus 6% depending on the if the diamond rough diamonds is coming then wholly obtained or ctsh plus 6% value addition when it is a polished diamond and uh, of the uh, you know different sizes then on precious stones we have different you know categories uh, we have not placed all the categories here but the general you know conditions are ctsh plus 20% value addition and ctsh plus 25% value addition similarly synthetic or Uh, reconstructed you know precious or semi precious stones this is the value addition here one important thing because now we are we are doing good job in terms of the you know, our our exporting our business community is doing uh, doing good job in terms of developing the lab grown diamonds so naturally you know uh, here the uh, for the purpose of the lab grown diamonds more than the uh, ctsh and value addition the process rule wherein the process will be specified and if that process is followed then that those exports will be considered as if originated from the partner country so the new thing which we will we have placed before the canadian side and uh, um, we are working with them similarly on the silver also uh, this is what we have we have suggested on the now coming to the you know for the ex exporters you know uh, knowledge if you look into the certificate of origin i hope that most of you are aware of that how certificate of origin can be obtained Uh, from the dgft website now you need to have a digital signature certificate dsc class 3 you know and um, which has a um, installed dsc software then you have to install a java in the system configure the java it is details are given here in and most of you are aware of that how it happens and then once you you are done then you get into the dgft website which has been mentioned here http uh, that you know uh, co.dgft.gov and then you can uh, uh, file for details here is the glimpse of the you know that how it looks when you uh, file your application for this now 
certain procedures, customs, or all of you are aware that customs notifications have been issued, all for rules of origin as, as well as tariff concessions. Then DGFT notifications have also been issued, uh, relevant DGFT notification, and there is a DGFT help desk. For the purpose of any problem you are facing on the certificate of origin, please, you know, uh, email them and um, tell them, or you can call them in terms of any certificate of origin problem, either here or at the, at the customs end in the, uh, like, you know, for your exports at the Australian side. Please let us know because we have the corresponding numbers of the Australian side wherein we'll immediately, you know, revert back to them and uh, we, we will try to sort out the issues. Now, having said so, uh, I place before you, all of you, a, you know, certain, you know, uh, like, you know, of course, uh, today uh, it, it is not uh, possible to uh, discuss all the issues, but one of the prime issues is how to definitely how to increase the exports. And all of you are aware that, you know, this year, of course, officially not said, but uh, um, uh, since last year, it was a, on the merchandise trade was about $422 billion. Therefore, this year also, there is an expectation that it should increase by a certain percentage. And uh, if you look into the Jameson jewelry exports, it is doing well, but we, it is expected that perhaps, you know, exports can be increased by a bit of effort during coming two, three months. And particularly on the Australia region, if you feel that, you know, the, you are facing any sort of problem in terms of uh, any hindrance on exports to Australia, or you want to have a one is to one discussion or as a group discussion with the, you know, high commissioner's office uh, or the, you know, the major importer in that country, uh, which you know better than us, but uh, we can organize a uh, meeting with uh, the exporting community from here. There is no issue on that. On the rules of origin, as I mentioned, that uh, there is going to be a further discussion with the audience as well as negotiation going on with the European Union, UK and Canada. I would um, suggest that uh, all of you should contribute to the Jameson Jewelry EPC in terms of, you know, what could be the appropriate rules of origin. Keeping in mind our offensive interest, and at the same time, um, there is no circumvention of the provisions. And third one is, of course, the non-tariff barriers. Actually, I, uh, why I mentioned this, you know, of course, James and Jewelry may not have that sort of non-tariff barriers. But I, I am told uh, by, you know, my colleagues in the FPSTVT desk that, you know, uh, in, in case of the Canada, they have suggested a, uh, a mutual recognition agreement for the purpose of the hall marking. Now, if you have similar, like, you know, issues with uh, respect to Australia or any other country, please let us know. Then we can work on that and try to, uh, because during the negotiations, Australia, we are going to have a negotiations again, shortly within two months, uh, within one and a half months. Naturally, uh, if you have any points, please, uh, please flag it immediately so that uh, we can work on that and uh, try to sort it out. I think uh, these are initial presentation, but they're open for any discussions, anytime. As um, uh, Mr. Ray mentioned, that uh, I have been working with Jameson Jewelry, uh, for the, with the Jameson Jewelry, you know, um, exporters, as well as the Jameson Jewelry EPC, since my joining of uh, in DGFT headquarters in 2003 onwards. And um, it was very pleasant to learn from you, not from you only, but uh, even the um, uh, the um, councils as well as exporters as well as the individuals and uh, it was uh, really many, like you know it's a uh, it's not very easy job uh, because this is uh, quite a comp uh, not a very simple thing like any other common it has its own complexities but definitely there are issues which we can sort out at our level with these words you know I will stop here but definitely there is a lot of scope to uh, further our exports and look into uh, the ex export prospects in Australia as well as Osania regions. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for uh, explaining in detail about the various provisions of this FTA Act agreement, as well as the conditions under which the certificate of origin is issued for getting the duty benefits in uh, Australia. On behalf of the members and the exporters, some of the doubts which the members would be having and which they have raised with us in the past, one which you already mentioned in your uh, presentation, you touched it slightly, is that the validation required as per ECTA for gems and jewelry is 1.5%. 
whereas the FTP says minimum value addition should be 3.5 percent. So, an exporter now exporting to Australia, will he be able to export if he achieves 1.5? Less than 3.5, I mean. You see, you are in a very, it is in a very peculiar situation and I understand because uh, mm. since uh, exports of uh, like, you know, jewelry, particularly, you know, studied jewelry or the um, um, precious metal jewelry, there you are importing the material. If it would have been grown in India, no, no issue. But since it is being imported from uh, outside and there is a duty component on that. Whenever you manufacture the final product and export it, generally you would like to take the exemptions of the duties. Whenever you are operating under the exemptions of the duties, definitely it, the FTP uh, like you know uh, provisions will uh, uh, fit into that. Therefore, we are working on it because, frankly speaking, at that point of time, time was very short. But at the same same time, people were looking for our offensive interest. Like you know, India has an offensive interest to export gems and jewelry. And with that uh, thing in the mind, it was, you know, uh, put at 1.5%. Definitely, uh, there is a case to increase it so that, you know, exporters can, you know, simultaneously. But one thing has to be kept in mind. Tomorrow, if, say, 3.5% in FT is, FTP is re uh, reviewed, then it will be difficult because then we have to negotiate the agreement to reduce, increase or reduce the, you know, value addition under that. That has to be also kept in mind. So, therefore, a balance has to be played. We will discuss with James and Jewelry EPC in detail and try to find out a midway wherein we can have such a provisions. You are muted. One more query is that, you know, the certificate of origin. Yeah. I think certificate of origin, although it is on an online basis, the members face sometimes difficulties. Sometimes the net is down, the connection is not there. Or the issuing agency has some queries, there is queries, and sometimes it takes three days, five days to get a certificate of origin. Not always, but many a times. So the demand from the members is now that the world is moving towards you know, on the basis of trust. So can't the certificate of origin be self issued uh, on the basis of self certification by the exporter? Because most uh, well developed countries, they insist and they like that the individual, you know, says and verifies his credentials itself. I'm very happy to hear this from the, you know, uh, Export Promotion Council because the Department of Commerce is promoting the cause of self-certification. You see, uh, when you are exporting under GSP to European Union, under the REC system, you are exporting at uh, as, uh, under the self-certification itself. And there has been no issue of any misdeclaration or something coming in. Of course, the European Union keeps on sending us not on gems and jewelry, the other, other sectors, you know, which are getting GSP. Now, those things come and we verified that hardly one or two rare cases which have been brought to the notice, wherein some, you know, uh, some uh, not, I should not say that, you know, uh, they have done uh, some sort of uh, fraud or something, but it is only because of the... Uh, uh, they were not aware of, you know, slightest, you know, changes in that, what will make them, you know, difficulty, uh, uh, make their life difficult. So as a result, uh, this has happened. So we are, we are looking forward for self-certification. Yeah. But only, only thing, only thing I can tell you, only, only issue is we were, we have to discuss everything with Department of Revenue. For exporters, we don't have any issue. You know, like, you know, exports, our exporters, because Department of Commerce is looking after it, we can go ahead with the self-certification. And our honorable minister is looking for that only, but only on the case of the imports, when the imports are taking place, then the customs comes into play. Now you cannot have two standards for the exports. You have self certification, whereas on the imports of, from the partner country, you will say that no, there will be, you know, certificate to be issued, but therefore a provision has been built in under India, Australia, ECTA. If you look into that, you know, provision, mm -hmm. that provision says that after uh, within two years, but after two years, we'll, we'll come out with this certification system. Now, under the self-certification system also, the revenue, I, I would like to place before you all, revenue is uh, suggesting that let it be, you know, limited to first, you know, authorized economic operators. Like, you know, those who are registered with the, uh, as a authorized economic operators, those will be, uh, you know, should be allowed for a self-certification and thereafter you allow to others. So, uh, this is an, another issue which, uh, which should be, you know, I will be discussing with all the EPCs very shortly. 
And maybe, you know, because in our sector, there are almost nil AEOs, at least status holder you know, or established exporter, you know, which who are recognized not only by the DGFT, but also by the customs. And customs as it is, is accepting the certification of the status holders. So at least the status holder and no exporters who are there in the business with, say, you know, some threshold limit of exports or over a period of last three to five years, at least to begin with, begin with at least they can be authorized, you know, when you are reviewing and when you are renegotiating this part of the agreement, then this can be considered. And Dugalji, I tell you, you know, there is no problem for our exporters without any, you know, even the revenue is not asking for that uh, mm -hmm. uh, it should be a self-certification. The issue is when the imports are coming from the partner country, their revenue is saying, no, we cannot allow them. Yeah, there should be some system, you know. As a result, the partner country, the partner FTA country said, say, says that there could, cannot be dual system wherein Indian exporters are getting the facility. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we are, we, are try, we, are, we are talking with the revenue to find out a solution. And I think there will be a solution and every world is moving towards self-certification and we should go for the self-certification. With certain checks and balances wherein I have suggested some policy, you know, formulation, which I will be discussing with uh, EPC in terms of, you know, what could be, you know, certain checks and balances. Okay, good. Uh, one more point which comes to the mind is, at present, this agreement, I think, speaks of outright exports. Whereas in, in many products, especially in our products, the exports are made on the basis of consignment exports as well as through exhibitions and export promotion tools. Now, when exporters are going for ex exhibitions or exporting on consignment basis, how would they get the benefit of this certificate of origin and the duty exemption in Australia? Uh, I tell you that uh, so far as the consignment exports and the exhibitions is concerned, we had a discussion with the Department of Revenue. And uh, they have prime of say agree. They said that only thing, it has to be uh, somewhere, you know, when it is exhibitions exports, the certificate of origin issued by the original EA, like, you know, the country where it is originating, that certificate of origin should be issued. And at the same time, there should be some sort of custom supervision, but we don't understand how the custom supervision will take place. If there is no duty in the, say, in the country of import where the exhibition is taking place. So the, they, the customs will not ask for any, any type of bondage or bonding or something. So there the custom supervision will be difficult. So we are, work, we are discussing with them. But as of now, uh, there should not be any difficulty in terms of EA, but if there is a custom supervision. Now, uh, how this will be operating, difficult, but uh, we are talking with revenue. Let, uh, let us, you know, um, within a month's time, I will be, it will be clear from this side. Yes, this will be of great help because in our sector, Exhibitions play a crucial role, and so do the consignment exports. Definitely. We'll but if this benefit can be given to the consignment export as well as the exhibition, then the exports can increase many fold in a very short time. Definitely. definitely. Because Australia definitely, although it by itself, the area wise it's a large country, but population wise it's a very thinly populated country. But from Australia, you know, the other neighboring countries like Fiji, where there's a big diaspora of, uh, our Indian diaspora is there, almost 50% population is of Indian origin, and New Zealand, or Papua New Guinea, you know, these neighboring countries, I think Australia has uh, its own grouping agreement with them. And from Australia, they, these things go beautifully to these countries. So our exports, when they go to Australia, they also would have access to the neighboring countries. So they, I think this all will unleash a big potential which can be encashed by the members. Yeah, you rightly mentioned, actually, the, these are the, perhaps it is a telepathy with your thought process. <laughs> I have already, you know, uh, I have discussed this issue with the High Commissioner's Office in all, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, and uh, New Zealand and all, and said that if, you know, Australia can be made as a gateway, as a hub. The hub from where the you know our consignments can move so they were very ap appreciating the thing they said that uh, let us work together perhaps you know ideas will come from the uh, exporting community as well as the james and jewelry epc 
that how for the other commodities i can understand you know we can work on that but uh, for the gems and jewelry how this can be done uh, perhaps a bit of you know idea from your side will be helpful we will definitely work on this this is an area which i'm thinking of because otherwise uh, our presence in new zealand and uh, not only gems and jewelry other sectors also new zealand and papua new guinea solomon island or you know fiji kiribati other islands is minuscule and those high commissioners have been requesting me that how we can increase the uh, though i i got some success in terms of uh, convincing some of the you know auto sectors and they are they are venturing but for for the gems and jewelry we have to work there you are you are muted one of the members has raised a question and his question is if the shipments are consolidated and sent by one company how the benefit would work i think the benefits are for the exporting company yes yes definitely not to his constituents or other members it will be given to only the company which actually exports and and the benefit is and the certificate of origin will be issued to only those who are exporting you know yes the certificate of origin will be issued to him only and based on that they will allow you but i don't think they have only duty on certain categories of the gems and jewelry mm. otherwise they don't have duty much of the you know uh, categories of uh, gem stones and other you know very good one more question this means that indirect export will be encouraged will not be encouraged but sorry sorry so i could not raise this this means the indirect export will not be encouraged indirect export means uh, through third country or uh, like you know or can can it be clarified for the you know the member may please clarify mr hari haran he has raised this query in india we don't have this system of consolidators in thailand and in some uh, malaysia or perhaps in singapore there are consolidators you know they pick up goods from various uh, persons on whom the orders are placed they consolidate and then they ship in india this i think practice is not there here there is only one exporter he has to i think he will buy or he will procure things from n number of people but he will as a individual or as a, as a one company he will export so all the benefits will accrue to him and he will only be required to fulfill all the formalities yeah. that even origin has to be given by him only by and it will be given to him only yes 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 right any other query from any member please there is one more will it help us jewelers to get an easy visa for a stay this is this is a very good question i i mm. i i couldn't uh, you know get into the you know benefits under the for the services sector mm. because i thought it's a good primarily but it's a very good question in terms of uh, you know under the indus ekta mm. uh, australia has allowed a lot of mobilities from starting from students to professionals to you know uh, various uh, visa regimes and uh, definitely it, uh, in under the indus ekta Mm. there is a there is a system wherein you know they can they, they will expedite they will not you know uh, uh, create much more hurdles they will expedite expedite the you know issuance of the visa but in case you have any suggestion or you are facing any problem please let me know because then we can built in in the next discussion which is going to happen under the uh, comprehensive agreement which is uh, uh, we are going to negotiate very shortly we are looking for uh, issues issues you know wherein if you are facing any difficulty in terms of despite the uh, elements which has been provided in the services uh, you know part yeah uh, the, the one member has raised can i ask you about exporting jewelry to guatemala oh see this agreement is with australia only it, and guatemala or El salvador do not form a part of the oceania group where australia is so this and, agreement will not be of any help there i think Yeah, I have actually India has signed so far thirteen FTAs and six PTAs. So thirteen FTAs and six PTAs and six PTAs also Guatemala does not figure in that. Therefore, if you want to have some sort 
you know arrangements with the guatemala then you can think of you know some of the ptas you have signed or some of the ftas you have signed and from that if you can route into guatemala uh, taking advantage of their rules of origin but otherwise uh, from india if it is going and the duty component is there they will not allow you the you know duty concessions in terms of any other question from any member please upar hai likhe थैंक Uh, Mr. Tapan Magumdar for sparing his time. I know he is a very busy person negotiating with Canada also and other countries, and he has vast experience as our EDD had already said in his opening remarks. In fact, the present chapter four, whatever is there in the chapter four for policies relating to the export of gold or precious metal jewelry, I think he is the mastermind or originator of all those conditions. He was the one person to whom we used to go in the GFP for any help or assistance or clarifications required in any of the uh, paras under Chapter Four. He is well aware of our sector. His experience in the Jamin Jewelry will always be, you know, known to our sector and will always be a boon whenever he negotiates uh, FTA with a uh, other country. Also, so thank you, sir. For sparing your time and thank you to Niti Madam also for giving her time and you know trying to understand as to how the agreement with Australia will be of help to the exporters unleash their potential and increase their exports. All the target set by the government is 400 million. I think with the help of this agreement, we will not only achieve it but surpass it easily. so thank you all and thank you all members for sparing their time and coming and listening to the benefits of this agreement and to see how you all can benefit out of it so thank you everyone and thank you sir thank you very much thanks a lot to everyone thank you.